Hello, dear brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining Mother and Refuge of the End Times. We would like to share with you an article published in Countdown to the Kingdom entitled Prophecy in Perspective. Confronting the subject of prophecy today is rather like looking at wreckage after a shipwreck. Archbishop Rino Fisichella, Prophecy in Dictionary of Fundamental Theology, page 788. As the world draws closer and closer to the end of this age, prophecy is becoming more frequent, more direct, and even more specific. But how do we respond to the more sensational of heaven's messages? What do we do when seers feel off or their messages simply don't resonate? The following is a guide for new and regular readers in the hopes to provide balance on this delicate subject so that one can approach prophecy without anxiety or fear that one is somehow being misled or deceived. The Rock The most crucial thing to remember always is that prophecy or so-called private revelation does not supplant the public revelation handed on to us through scripture and sacred tradition and safeguarded through apostolic succession. All that is needed for our salvation has already been revealed. Throughout the ages, there have been so-called private revelations, some of which have been recognized by the authority of the Church. They do not belong, however, to the deposit of faith. It is not their role to improve or complete Christ's definitive revelation, but to help live more fully by it in a certain period of history. Guided by the magisterium of the Church, the sensus fidelium knows how to discern and welcome in these revelations whatever constitutes an authentic call of Christ or his saints to the Church. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 67. Unfortunately, some Catholics have misinterpreted this teaching to mean that we do not, therefore, have to listen to private revelation. That is false and, in fact, a careless interpretation of Church teaching. Even controversial theologian Father Karl Rahner once asked whether anything God reveals can be unimportant. Visions and Prophecies, page 25. And theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar said, One can therefore simply ask why God provides revelations continuously in the first place if they hardly need to be heeded by the Church. Mystica Objectiva, number 35. Hence, Pope Benedict XIV taught, One may refuse assent to private revelation without direct injury to Catholic faith, as long as he does so modestly, not without reason, and without contempt. Heroic Virtue, page 397. Let me stress that, not without reason, while public revelation contains all that we need for our salvation, it does not necessarily reveal all that we need for our sanctification, especially at certain periods in salvation history. Put another way, no new public revelation is to be expected before the glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet even if revelation is already complete, it has not been made completely explicit. It remains for Christian faith gradually to grasp its full significance over the course of centuries. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 67. Just as a flower in its bud form is still the same flower as when it has bloomed, so too sacred tradition has attained new beauty and depth 2,000 years later after having bloomed throughout the centuries. Prophecy, then, does not add petals to the flower, but often unfolds them, releasing new fragrances and pollen, that is, fresh insights and graces for the Church and the world. For example, The messages given to St. Faustina add nothing to the public revelation that Christ is mercy and love itself. Rather, they impart deeper insights into the depth of that mercy and love, and how to more practically acquire them through trust. Likewise, the sublime messages imparted to servant of God Luisa Picciaretta do not improve or complete Christ's definitive revelation, but draw the attentive soul into the mystery of the divine will already spoken of in Scripture, but granting deeper insight into its fecundity, power, and centrality in the plan of salvation. This is all to say, then, that when you read the messages here on Countdown to the Kingdom, the first litmus test is whether or not the messages are in harmony with sacred tradition. 
Hopefully, we as a team have properly vetted all the messages in this regard, though the final discernment ultimately belongs to the Magisterium. Listening, not despising. The second thing to point out from number 67 of the Catechism is that it states that some private revelations have been recognized by the authority of the Church. It does not say all or even that they must be officially recognized, though that would be the ideal. All too frequently I hear Catholics say, that seer isn't approved, stay away. But neither scripture nor the church herself teaches that. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others discern. But if a revelation is given to another person sitting there, the first one should be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. Indeed, the spirits of prophets are under the prophet's control, since he is not the God of disorder, but of peace. 1 Corinthians 14, 29-33 While this can often be practiced on the spot regarding the regular exercise of prophecy in a community, when supernatural phenomena are accompanied, a deeper investigation by the Church into the supernatural character of such revelations may be necessary. This may or may not take some time. Today, more than in the past, news of these apparitions is diffused rapidly among the faithful thanks to the means of information, mass media. Moreover, the ease of going from one place to another fosters frequent pilgrimages so that ecclesiastical authority should discern quickly about the merits of such matters. On the other hand, modern mentality and the requirements of critical scientific investigation render it more difficult, if not almost impossible, to achieve with the required speed the judgments that in the past concluded the investigation of such matters. Constat de supernaturalitate, non constat de supernaturalitate, and they offered to the ordinaries the possibility of authorizing the prohibiting public cult or other forms of devotion among the faithful. Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Norms Regarding the Manner of Proceeding in the Discernment of Presumed Apparitions or Revelations, Number 2, Vatican.va. The revelations to Saint Juan Diego, for instance, were approved on the spot as a miracle of the tilma took place before the bishop's eyes. On the other hand, despite the miracle of the sun, witnessed by tens of thousands that confirmed Our Lady's words at Fatima, Portugal, the Church took thirteen years to approve the apparitions and then several more decades after that before the consecration of Russia was supposedly made. And even then, some dispute whether it was done properly, since Russia was not explicitly mentioned in John Paul II's Act of Entrustment. See, did the consecration of Russia happen? Here's the point. In Guadalupe, the bishop's approval of the apparitions immediately paved the way for millions of conversions in that country in the years to follow, essentially putting an end to the culture of death and human sacrifice there. However, the delay or non-response of the hierarchy with Fatima objectively resulted in World War II and the spread of Russia's errors, communism, that has not only claimed tens of millions of lives all over the world, but is now positioned through the Great Reset to be implemented globally. Two things can be observed from this. One is that not yet approved does not mean condemned. This is a common and serious mistake among many Catholics, primarily because there is virtually no catechesis on prophecy from the pulpit. There could be a number of reasons why certain private revelations have not been officially recommended as worthy of belief, which is what approved means. The Church may still be discerning them. The seers may still be alive, and hence a decision is deferred while revelations are ongoing. The bishop may simply have not initiated a canonical review and or may have no plans to do so, which is his prerogative. None of the above is necessarily a declaration that an alleged apparition or revelation is constat de non supernaturalité and non supernatural in origin or lacking signs manifesting it to be so. Second, it is clear that heaven doesn't wait for canonical investigations. 
Usually, God provides sufficient evidence for belief in messages that are especially intended for a larger audience. Hence, Pope Benedict XIV said, Are they to whom a revelation is made, and who are certain it comes from God, bound to give a firm assent thereto? The answer is in the affirmative. Heroic Virtue, Volume 3, page 390. As for the rest of the body of Christ, he goes on to say, He to whom that private revelation is proposed and announced ought to believe and obey the command or message of God if it be proposed to him on sufficient evidence. For God speaks to him, at least by means of another, and therefore requires him to believe. Hence it is that he is bound to believe God who requires him to do so. Ibid, page 394. When God speaks, he expects us to listen. When we don't, there can be catastrophic consequences. Read Why the World Remains in Pain. On the other hand, when we do obey heaven's revelations based on sufficient evidence, the fruits can last for generations. Read When They Listened. All that said, if a bishop gives directives to his flock that are binding on their consciences, We must always obey them, as he is not the God of disorder, but of peace. But how do we know? If the Church has not begun or concluded an investigation, what is sufficient evidence for one person may not be so for another. Of course, there will always be those who are so cynical, so skeptical toward anything supernatural, that they would not believe were Christ to raise the dead before their very eyes. But here, I am speaking about those who recognize that an alleged seer's messages may not contradict a Catholic teaching, but who still wonder if said revelations are truly supernatural in origin, or simply the fruit of the seer's imagination. St. John of the Cross himself, a recipient of divine revelations, warned against self-delusion. I am appalled at what happens in these days, namely, when some soul with the very smallest experience of meditation, if it be conscious of certain locutions of this kind in some state of recollection, at once christens them all as coming from God, and assumes that this is the case, saying, God said to me, God answered me, whereas it is not so at all, but, as we have said, it is for the most part they who are saying these things to themselves. And, over and above this, the desire which people have for locutions, and the pleasure which comes to their spirits from them, lead them to make answer to themselves, and then to think that it is God who is answering them and speaking to them. St. John of the Cross, The Ascent of Mount Carmel, Book 2, Chapter 29, Number 4 and 5. So yes, this is very possible, and probably more frequent than not, which is why supernatural phenomena like the stigmata, miracles, conversions, etc., are considered by the Church as further proof of claims to supernatural origin. But St. John's warnings are not a cause to fall into another temptation. Fear. Fear that everyone who claims to hear from the Lord is deceived or a false prophet. It is tempting for some to regard the entire genre of Christian mystical phenomena with suspicion, indeed to dispense with it altogether as too risky, too riddled with human imagination and self-deception, as well as the potential for spiritual deception by our adversary the devil. That is one danger. The alternate danger is to so unreservedly embrace any reported message that seems to come from the supernatural realm that proper discernment is lacking, which can lead to the acceptance of serious errors of faith and life outside of the Church's wisdom and protection. According to the mind of Christ, that is, the mind of the Church, neither of these alternative approaches, wholesale rejection on the one hand and undiscerning acceptance on the other, is healthy. Rather, the authentic Christian approach to prophetic graces should always follow the dual apostolic exhortations in the words of St. Paul, do not quench the spirit, do not despise the prophecy, and test every spirit retain what is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-21. Dr. Mark Miraville, Private Revelation Discerning with the Church, page 3 and 4. In fact, 
Every single baptized Christian is himself or herself expected to prophesy to those around them, first by their witness, second by their words. The faithful, who by baptism are incorporated into Christ and integrated into the people of God, are made sharers in their particular way in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly office of Christ, who fulfills this prophetic office not only by the hierarchy, but also by the laity. He accordingly both establishes them as witnesses and provides them with the sense of the faith, sensus fidei, and the grace of the word, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 897-904. On this point, it should be kept in mind that prophecy in the biblical sense does not mean to predict the future, but to explain the will of God for the present, and therefore show the right path to take for the future. Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, Message of Fatima, Theological Commentary, www.vatican.va. Still, one has to distinguish between the prophetic office, inherent to all believers, and the prophetic gift, the latter being a specific charism for prophecy, as mentions in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, 14, 4, etc. This may take the form of words of knowledge, interior locutions, audible locutions, or visions and apparitions.